This year, California Free Thought Day will celebrate its 20th year. But the catalyst for this annual celebration dates back hundreds of years. We have with us today David Diskin, the chair and self proclaimed Poobah of the California Three Thought Day Planning Committee. David will present a retrospective of free thought that begins in 1692. He will talk about its shocking roots, the beginnings of Sacramento's celebration at the state capitol, and how CFD evolved into what it is today, the nation's largest annual event celebrating free thought. David, it's all yours. Awesome. Thank you so much. It is great to be here for uh, AOF, and I just want to say thank you for giving me and Free Thought Day the opportunity to present to everybody that's here, everybody that might watch this later. And uh, especially, I just want to thank, I see that they're both here, uh, Minga and Jerry, uh, for creating this tradition 20 years ago and uh, passing the reins to me sometime later <laughs> um, so that we could still be here and talk about it. And this is Dimitri, and he's going to... Uh, I don't know what he's going to do. He's going to get pets and loves while I talk and pretend like he's not here. Um, I want to just ask everybody, if you could, just mute yourself. But as we go through our time together today, if you have any questions, feel free to unmute or use your chat window. And I'll try and keep an eye on both all of that and answer any questions that come up. Um, but Pam, thank you so much for that introduction. Let me share my screen with you because that's really where all this is at. It's on PowerPoint. You don't need to see me. So let me go ahead and share my screen and then we'll really begin. Give me one second here. All right. So I think that's working and I do hear a couple people with some background noise. So let me try and fix that real quick too. All right, cool. <clears throat> so I think you should, you should be able to see my screen now. Just let me know if for some reason that's not working. And let's, uh, let's get this started. So like I said, Free Thought Day is uh, it's 20 years old. I, I can't believe that. I first got involved with this in 2010. That was my first attending of a, a, a Free Thought Day. Um, but uh, I, I still, I just think it's so incredible that we've been doing this for so long. There's probably a couple of people on the phone, on the phone, on Zoom that don't know what Free Thought Day is. And so I just wanna give you a, a very quick overview and we'll talk more about what it is and what it's become and where it's going a little bit later this afternoon. But essentially Free Thought Day combines the fun and atmosphere of a fair with the education and activism of a conference. We call it a festival of free thought. Um, I've, uh, I don't know if I call myself the, the, the grand poobah of this event, uh, but I have been the lead organizer since 2011 when I uh, was given the reins from Minga and uh, everyone else that was involved at the time, Beverly and, and Jerry. Uh, I've also been the stage manager for the Reason Rally. I've been a former president of Camp Quest West, helped with the Secular Coalition for California, and the Sacramento area uh, coalition reason. And it's been a blast uh, in meeting so many people and helping other people involved with all these things too. That's enough about me. Like Pam said, we're gonna go all the way back to 1692 at the beginning of the Salem Witch Trials. And we're gonna talk about what happened in the span of about 10 months there. And then we're gonna fast forward couple hundred years to 2001 and what Jerry and Minga did to bring us to where we are today. And then we'll talk a little bit further about what we have planned. When I think of the Salem Witch Trials, the very first thing that comes to my mind is this scene from Monty Python and the Holy Grail. I think we can all probably quote this, at least a couple lines from it, right? burn her, I'm not a newt, I got better, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, accurate, maybe not, funny, absolutely. 
Um, there's also the movie, The Crucible, and that's based off of a play and everything else. You know, here's some scenes from 1996 with uh, Winona Ryder and other people. Again, a little bit more accurate, but you know, it was done for TV, right? For the movies. So let's let's dive in a little bit further. In the upper right hand corner ish, you'll see Danvers, Massachusetts. That is today where Salem Village was. And at the time, right, going all the way back to the 1600s, the population of Salem, including Salem Village and Salem Town, was only about 2,000 people. It's hard to think about a city or, or, or a region that small. You know, those of you from Sacramento, you may be familiar with Wheatland, California. Today, Wheatland is twice as big as Salem Village was then. And, you know, that, that whole time, uh, at that same time, the, the population of the colony of Massachusetts was only 50,000 people. All right, so Salem was yeah, big-ish, not to today's standards, but a pretty decent sized area, I hesitate to call it a city, uh, in the time, right, for Massachusetts. An important figure that we have to consider is Cotton Mather. Cotton Mather was a minister, he was an author, he was also a scientist and an incredible one. He is in some sense responsible for the concept of inoculation, certainly something important today. And uh, of course, back then it was about smallpox and he didn't discover it, but he was certainly a pioneer behind the research that went into it and professing how important inoculation was. He was also working on plant hybridization. And, uh, and, and, and so this is sort of like the, the, the best of both worlds. We've got a minister and a scientist together in cotton. He was, however, very Puritan very Puritan. Uh, his father, by the way, was the president of Harvard. His name was Increase Mather. And uh, yeah, so I mean, I have mixed feelings about this guy. I absolutely respect his contributions to science, not so sold on his contributions with the church, but it is what it is. And one of the things that he was known for was from a scientific perspective, and I'm gonna put that in air quotes, from a scientific perspective, trying to figure out what this whole witchcraft thing is in the 1600s. Basically, if you were experiencing random screams, seizures, epilepsy, neck or back pain, or thinking about inflicting self-harm, you may have what was called disease of the astonishment. But basically, they just called that witchcraft. And people back then believed in witchcraft. They believed in the devil. I guess people still do today. They thought that maybe the devil would inhabit your body, take over for a time. And in doing so, that would cause you to have these seizures and epilepsy and everything else and do all kinds of crazy things. They didn't really think people were turning other people into newts, but they thought that maybe someone who was afflicted by witchcraft could then harm somebody else and give them some of the problems that were attributed to witchcraft at the time. Now, back in Salem in, in 1692, there were three children in particular that were showing these symptoms. And Cotton happened to be strolling through Salem at the time. He thought they were either inhabited by the devil or affected by someone who was. In other words, someone cast a spell on them. And uh, that was not good. But I want to be clear, that's not the only thing that was happening at the time. I want to ask you what you think started the whole craze of the Salem witch trials? Do you think it was families competing each other over land and property and cows and other resources? Do you think it was religious strife between the Puritans and some other people? Or do you think racism had something to do with it? Maybe gender inequality? Some of the things that we still face today, maybe there was some kind of friction between the colony and England, or maybe it was because 
Massachusetts had just earned new leadership from, the, from England, or maybe it was just a lack of established laws because everything was still new. We didn't have everything literally written down. The courts hadn't even really been formed yet. So let's make this interactive. What do you think it is? Open up your chat window, throw in a letter. Let me know what you think led to the, led to the Salem witch trials and the hysteria of accusing other people and everything else that happened. I've got a vote for G, I've got a vote for D, I've got a vote for F, got a vote for greed, I guess you could put greed under A. I'll give you another 10 seconds to throw a letter in there. <laughs> Some of you are catching on. Yeah, it's, it's all of them. It's all of them. There was this woman, Sarah Osborne. She had just got a, uh, a divorce and there was a settlement involved with some property and she didn't want the property to go to her husband's children. She wanted to take it for herself. There was this other Sarah who, whose husband was not pleased with her. There was this woman named Tatuba who was a South American Indian woman who just happened to be in Salem. There was the friction, of course, between colonies and England. There really was a new governor at the time. There was no laws that were really written down or established. It's all of these things. And so on March 1st of 1692, three women, Sarah Osborne, Sarah Good, and Tatuba, were jailed. There was another woman named Martha. She was a ranking member of the church, and she learned about what had happened to these three women that they were accused of practicing witchcraft. And she's like, that's silly. And then she got accused of practicing witchcraft because they didn't want to have any kind of uh, rebellion in their own ranks. Now, granted, witchcraft, witchcraft was not rampant. It was already, the, even the idea that witchcraft was a thing was already waning, but not in Salem. And so the blame game happened because if you were accused of witchcraft, you knew that you were going to be sentenced and probably executed unless you came clean and confessed. If you confessed to witchcraft, then they'd go easy on you. They'd try and help you out, whatever that meant. Uh, you still wouldn't be a good standing in society. But if you blame somebody... <laughs> Oh, if you pointed out, if you ratted, if you, if you told on other witches, then that looked kind of good, right? So like, okay, well, if you're going to accuse me of, witch, of being a witch, then I know that I can get out of it if I come clean and maybe I will accuse Jerry and Kaylee and Kathy and Arlene of also being witches, and then that'll make my sentence a little bit more lenient. And so all these people blamed all these other people, blamed all these other people, seriously, not to mention all the other problems and just, you know what, I don't like the way you looked at me or my kid got sick and that kid was over with your kid last week. Obviously it's witchcraft. So we have all these things happening. Yeah, McCarthyism, yeah, <laughs> a lot like that. And so, we have law and order. On May 27th, Governor William Phipps, who was brand new to, this, to, to Massachusetts, ordered a special court to be formed, a court of Oyer and Terminer to prosecute, which means to hear and determine what's going on with all this witchcraft stuff. Why are all these people being arrested? Let's Let's figure this stuff out. Let's, uh, we're filling up the jails. So let's do something about it. So William Phipps creates this court. March 1st, or March, we had those first three uh, arrests. By the end of March, or sorry, by the end of April, we had 21 more arrests. By May 10th, Sarah Osborne dies while in jail. That didn't look good. And on May 27th, William Phipps' court was established. A couple days later, by then, we had 62 people in custody for witchcraft 
And I want to remind you that this is a city or a, a, a town with a population of only 2,000 people. Yeah. And so these court hearings start happening. And of course, in any court, as you are creating the court, you're using, you know, what, what laws you inherited or evolved from other jurisdictions. We brought a lot of that over from England. And of course, if you're going to be tried in court, or if you're a lawyer argue, arguing one way or the other, you have evidence that you could admit to the court, like a confession, of course. Or, you know, testimony. I saw this happen. We saw this happen. We're an expert witness, and this happened. Just like today's court. Oh, and by the way, you know, there's also spectral evidence, right? <laughs> yeah, spectral evidence. That's, that's, that was a legal term which basically just meant anything that we can't explain, it's evidence. You can see where this is going. And so Cotton Mather said this at the end of May, after all these people have been arrested and are now starting to go through the court system, he said, do not lay more stress on pure spectral evidence than it will bear. It's very certain that the devils have sometimes represented the shapes of persons not only innocent, but also very virtuous. Though I believe that the just God then ordinarily provides a way for the speedy vindication of the persons thus abused. So he's basically saying, okay, witchcraft is a thing, but let's not get carried away, people. Let's, you know, use due process. A couple days later, Bridget Bishop was found guilty of living an immoral lifestyle, wearing black clothing and the occasional odd costumes, and being a witch. She was convicted on June 2nd and executed eight days later. She was the first person to die from the Salem witch trials. People started to think, wow, that was quick. Are we being a bit too hasty? And so before they had any other cases, they adjourned the court for 20 days. And they wrote to local leaders from the church, from government, and they asked for some words of wisdom. What words of wisdom can you give our court so we can continue these proceedings fairly with just with honor, rightfully so. And so the people to whom they asked for advice congregated and wrote back a letter to the court in Salem with these eight bullet points. I've summarized them here. They say to act now, to find those witches, but to use caution and don't trust everybody. Don't rush through this. Don't forget the devil also afflicts, afflicts good people. Don't fall for his tricks, but to prosecute vigorously. So this court receives this letter with these eight points on it. And they happen to kind of ignore maybe half of them. No joke. They didn't see the, the four in between. They saw the first two and the last two. Act now, find the witches, don't fall for the devil, prosecute vigorously. And that's what they did. That was what was important to them. Completely dismissing half of the advice given to them by that council. And so back to our timeline, by June, five more women were executed in July, five more in August, eight more in September, and a man, the first, for refusing to plea. Cotton Mather is like, whoa, whoa, okay, this is crazy. We've now lost a lot of people. That I may be the more capable to assist in living up to a stand, lifting up to a standard against the infernal enemy, he is requesting of the court a narrative of the evidence given in at the trials of half a dozen, or if you please, a dozen 
of the principal witches that have been condemned. So he's taking it upon himself to try and right a wrong or at least prevent future deaths by saying, hey, court, with all due respect, give me whatever evidence you have so I may read through it and see if I can help you. You remember, he still believes in witches and witchcrafts and the devil and all of that, but he's like, this is, this is getting out of control. And so he does get his evidence. And on October 3rd, he has a chat with his father. Remember, the, his father was the president of Harvard. And they denounce the term spectral evidence. That then gets passed on to the governor, Governor Phipps, who immediately on October 12th calls for a moratorium on all proceedings and writes a letter to England called the Privy Council, which is basically like a cabinet, and says this, this, this Salem that you got here, right, that you just kind of put me in charge, oh, there are some problems here. And by doing this, by that moratorium, that was the end of it. Governor Phipps took the advice of Increase Mather and Cotton and said, this is, this is done. The court was officially ended a couple weeks later without any other cases being tried. And that, of course, is the day that we celebrate for Free Thought Day, when the governor sent that letter back to England saying, this has got to stop. And he said, no more court cases, October 12th, 1692. Governor Phipps said, when I put an end to the court, there were at least 50 persons in prison in great misery by reason of the extreme cold, wet cold and their poverty, most of them having only spectral evidence against them. He asked Cotton Mather to use science, the scientific method to find witches. Cotton couldn't come up with any. He ended the court, and in January, a new court, a completely new superior court was formed with clear, clear instructions, do not accept spectral evidence. During that time, there were 52 trials. Only three of them were sentenced to death, but the king overturned those as well, well, technically his attorney general. And so no one else died. But in the five months that the Salem witch trials took place, in which they took place, there were roughly 200 accused. And just getting accused was not good for your reputation. By the way, 80% of them were women. Of those 200 that were accused, 30 were found guilty. 20 were executed, and five more died in jail. The hysteria that happened in Salem did not happen anywhere else. Here's a pie chart showing that for the 20 some people that died in Salem, a population of 2000, there were 16 other executions throughout the entire colony of Massachusetts and Connecticut in the entire 20th, 17th century. And so Salem represents 61% of all the executions with only 5% of its population. A historian a couple hundred years later, well, roughly in 1914, George Lincoln Burr, he looked back at the Salem witchcraft trials and said that this is the rock on which the theocracy shattered. Oh, bless his heart. That was in 1914. He died 20 years later. He didn't live to see the 1950s McCarthyism, the moral majority, Hobby Lobby. But at least in 1914, he discovered or he, he made this statement. And that's our little history lesson on the beginnings of California Free Thought Day. Now, California Free Thought Day does come from humble beginnings, as I'm sure Minga and Jerry will tell anyone. It started, in a sense, 
well, at least the inspiration for it started back in Sac Sacramento State. Now, I don't know if this was the student union back in the late 1990s. I know they have a new building now. But at the time, Minga, who's on our call with us, hey, Minga. Minga was a professor at Sac State. She taught pedagogy, specifically elementary science, elementary school science. I mean, how cool is that? That's a hero right there. Anybody who can teach science to kids has my heart. And so she was teaching pedagogy at Sac State to help build future science teachers. And for a while when she was on campus, she and, and her husband, Paul, and others probably noted uh, that every now and then religious groups would have tables. And there was a lot of them. These are usually campus groups that are looking for prospective students. And uh, I guess I, I, I don't blame her. At some point, it kind of got to her. And so, <laughs> Minga told me over the phone, she said, it was like the Holy Land. I get it. I absolutely get it because there was no other representation there. I imagine the majority of those groups were Christian, very few of any diversity whatsoever outside of that, and certainly no atheist group. And so Mingo wanted to have her own table and she did what all good activists do. She made a banner and they had a table at CSU Sacramento. The banner says, try reality, the invisible and the non-existent look very much alike. And so in partnership or some kind of inspiration with Freedom From Religion Foundation, they declared Free Thought Week and they tabled all week long. Minga did that the first year. And Jerry, who I think I saw, yeah, Jerry's, hey, Jerry. Jerry Sloan did it the second year. Jerry noted, Every year the students change over. This isn't going anywhere. Let's do a public event. Yeah. Let's do a public event, Jerry. What a great idea. As a side note to this, the Godless Americans March on Washington, I know some of you were there, that happened not long after all of this in November 2 of 2002. But, just prior to that march, we have Jerry and Minga to thank for creating Free Thought Day in Sacramento. So on Saturday, October 12th, the year 2002, at the Sacramento County Courthouse Plaza, they held a public event right here outside the courthouse. The theme was delight in free thinking, and I love it. And it has set the stage, that theme, for every Free Thought Day since, in that it is positive. Positive. We want to put a good light on atheists and humanists and secularists and science and everything else that we're about. Yes, we are occasionally angry and rightfully so. But this first event was about delight in free thinking. Minga, of course, was there. Cleo Kosel, who's no longer with us, was there. Kevin Schultz of AOF was a speaker. Bobby Kirkhart, who uh, Sarah and I just saw a couple months ago. She was there. She the, was the president of Atheist Alliance International. Of course, Paul was there, who's no longer with us. Ron Fegley from Hagsa was there as speakers. And so they held their event at the courthouse. And I love some of those banners. Free thinkers for the wall between, between church and state, democracy, not theocracy. There was live music. Minga on guitar with Henda. I love it. They sang a song that for the majority of, of Free Thought Day has been a tradition. And we haven't done it in the last couple of years, but I did find this video of someone not affiliated with Free Thought Day, but just doing an amazing job of his rendition of a song called Die, uh, sorry, Die Gedanken sind frei. And I wanna just play a little bit for you here. Let's get this introduction going in. 
This is a song that dates back to the 1500s in its its original form. This Pete is John from a, 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 a girls' school songbook printed in the 1770s. It was a resistance song in Germany during World War II with an anti-Nazi song. It says, thoughts are free. Die Gedanken sind frei. My thoughts freely flower. Die Gedanken sind frei. My thoughts give me power. No scholar can map them. No hunter can trap them. No man can deny. Die Gedanken sind frei. No man can deny. Die Gedanken sind frei. And so that event took place and started so many traditions that we still carry through today, 20 years later. They read a proclamation commemorating 310 years of reason into law, inspired by, of course, the Salem Witch Trials and Governor Phipps. The event was primarily organized by members of atheists and other freethinkers. In 2003, they moved the event to the Waterfront Park in Old Town make it even more public, more accessible. They got people to come who didn't even know that the event was happening because they just happened to walk by. They had the Freethinker Gallery, and you can see this in the background there. Small speeches, poetry, literature tables, live music, even a raffle that we still do today. I want to talk about those Freethinkers in the background a little bit. This was inspired by a display that Minga and Paul saw at the Sacramento Greek Festival. She wanted to have some kind of presence at Free Thought Day that harkened back to our roots, our founders, in a sense, and free thinkers all across the world through all different times. And so they selected and inducted these people into the Free Thought Gallery Mark Twain, Clarence Darrow. Francis Wright, Dennis Dero, Matilda Jocelyn Gage, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Thomas Paine, and Robert Ingersoll. And not too long after that, on her second year, William Phipps as well. Of course, it looks a little different now, but uh, Tom, which I think I saw Tom and Wendy on the phone, keep saying phone, uh, redid this, and now we have our Freethinker Gallery, a giant 10 by 20 memorial to these great people. So you can come and see that this October. There's the band book display, which I love. And I wanted to share with you some of the themes from prior years as well. Delight in free thinking, stand up for reason, stay curious, equality for everyone. Vote for a reason. Think again. Engage with reason on my shirt. They had proclamations that were read from the stage, including in 2005, on the left, a proclamation from then mayor, Sacramento Mayor Heather Fargo, and later after that, the entire Sacramento City Council that I know Rachel Harrington and Kelly Karras put together. We now have an entire web page devoted to these proclamations because we've kept it going. And I know Kaylee's on the phone. Kaylee, I just want to thank you for all your work in getting the dozens of proclamations that we now have. You can go to freethoughtday.org and see every single one. Because of this work, Richard Pan, Senator Richard Pan, introduced Senate Resolution 79. It did not pass, but it also didn't fail. It got put in what's called limbo, Bill Limbo. But for the first time in the history of anything, California Free Thought Day, there was a bill to recognize it from the Senate, which we're quite proud of. And we thank Richard Pan for doing that. It received a tremendous amount of support from the committees that it was passed through. And you can see there, it's a little small, but you can see this on our website. 
all those yes votes, only a handful of no votes. It remained at the waterfront, waterfront park until 2008. And every year, it just got a little bigger and a little bigger. In 2005, Camp Quest got involved. 2006, Michael Newdow gave a history lesson about the Constitution. In 2008, Keith Lowell Jensen performed. Here's some flyers from some of the past years. In 2009 and 2010, when I first went to Free Thought Day, it was held at Cesar Chavez Park. Herb Servilman came out in 29, or 2009, Bruce Maiman, 2010. 2011, that was my first year organizing the event. We held it at McGeorge School of Law. Dan Barker, Fred Edwards, Elizabeth Cornwell came out, and so many other awesome people. Here's the Phenomenots from Oakland playing on stage. And I tell you, I could not, I could not have taken the reins from Minga and Jerry and Beverly and anyone else if it weren't for Tom and Wendy, Rachel, Kelly, Ken and Ruth, Kara Lee, Deb, and of course, Minga and Jerry. Yeah, I remember sitting in a coffee shop and I don't remember what that shop was called. It's not there any longer. They were really supportive of us and we were just sitting around saying like can we really do this can we pull this off and we did there's dan barker there's ken there's the mockingbirds they were a sack fan split off a vocal group we wanted to make the event longer we wanted to hold a fundraising reception instead of just a dinner bring in sponsors and paid advertising to help fund the event and make it even bigger, even better. But we kept the same elements. We kept the Free Thought Gallery. We kept the live music and entertainment. We kept the proclamations. And there's a program from that year, come out and celebrate reason. Speaking of the program, one of the things that I'm proud of is implementing our code of conduct in 2012 to make sure that we are absolutely clear on what we allow and don't allow at Free Thought Day. And this is up on our website. We've made minor changes to it ever since. In 2012, we started the authors panel. And the very next year, we expanded that to include podcasters as well. Soon after that, in 2016, we rebranded, changed our logo. I wanna thank Paul Ryron for the logo you see in the lower left, lower right corner. And we added the word California to Free Thought Day. Rather than just Sacramento, we have had higher aspirations. What we're doing in Sacramento is great, but I want to get the whole state involved. We are here at the seat of the Capitol, right? With the Capitol here. Let's put it to use. Let's bring even more people to our event. Let's bring national, more national speakers in. Let's get Southern California to come up here. And so we did. And we became California Free Thought Day. Right around that time is also when we incorporated, officially splitting off from atheists and other free thinkers, becoming a 501c3, getting our own checkbook, our own bank account. So of course, I have to thank AOF for 14 years of allowing us to use <laughs> their 501c3 status and bank account. So we incorporated, we came up with bylaws and all of that stuff and a board. In 2017, we had our very first visit from an elected official, at least to my knowledge. Senator Richard Pan came out and we gave him an award for all of the amazing work that he had done in the year prior to remove religious vaccination exemptions from the public schools. Looking back at that four years later, oh, I'm so glad that he did. You think COVID is bad now. Imagine, imagine if you could just, well, I guess we're almost back to where we were. We do have to be careful about that. But we absolutely appreciate what Richard Pan has done. He's not running again. 
I think he's, uh, <laughs> he's had enough. But uh, it was great to have him there. And that led the way to bring other elected officials to California Free Thought Day, including my elected official, uh, Jerry McNerney, who was also the co-founder of the Congressional Free Thought Caucus. So in 2018, we had our first federal representative with us. That's also the same term. Yeah, that's right. Karen's right. He's, he's termed out. That's also the same year that we started our scholarship, originally at $500, now it's a little over $1,000 if you look at all the different scholarships combined. And so here's two of the past winners of our scholarships, thanks to Angie, and Angela, sorry, and everyone else that's been a part of that committee. We started recognizing our local volunteers and leaders, and when I say local, I mean everywhere in the state. So we recognized Jerry Sloan, not just for his work with Free Thought Day, but in the LGBT community. And Judy Sink for her amazing work with the California or the uh, Sacramento Coalition of Reason, her newsletter, and keeping that going. And of course, by forming the Freedom from Religion Foundation chapter in Sacramento. We still keep these awards going today. I'm also very proud of the diversity that we brought to California Free Thought Day. It was uh, very white. And over the last 10 years, I think we've seen a change in that. That being said, we have a long way to go. But I'm really proud that we've made it this far and continue to do so. We expanded our core values in 2018. California Free Thought Day was just about freedom of thought and speech, enthusiasm for science, and the separation of church and state. And it was in 2018 that we realized that this is not enough. Like many other national groups and some state groups, we concluded what we should have known 20, 30 years ago, that an atheist group or a humanist group or a secular group or a science group is not just about that. It's about so much more. It's about recognizing that human life, <laughs> there's so many things that we could do. Besides just, there's no God today, let's keep God outside of the Constitution. When there are people suffering for religious bias, yes. But let's go further than that. What about gender inequality? What about racial bias and discrimination? Systematic issues within our court system. Abortion rights and access to contraception, that's not an atheist thing, but it is something that we can get behind because it's important. And so we expanded our core values to include civic engagement and social justice because we should. There's no question about that. There are things that haven't changed. We kept, whoops, accidentally skipped the backwards a little bit. There we go. We kept those great community booths and added new ones. We brought Uncle Sam or Andy Swan year after year after year. Of course, we have Tom Eichelman's Free Thought Gallery, which we add to every single year. We've kept the dinner, but now it's a reception with its own agenda or sorry, schedule or its own program of live entertainment. We've kept a positive theme every single time. Secular pride, reason in the voting booth, the wonders of magic and reason, voices of reason, and so on. Our 2021 theme is a brighter future with reason. As we reflect back on the last 20 years. But one thing that we have done differently is move the event to the Capitol ever since I think it was 2017. It's a symbolic move. For the most part, it's a great venue. There's no doubt about that. It's also free. It does come with some limitations though. But the symbolism of being right there at the steps, literally, of our capital. What better place to be to inspire people to run for office, to change legislation, to see the problems that exist, and to do something about it. And so every year since then, with the exception of last year, 
We had it at the Capitol. Now, speaking of current days, I want to just give a shout out to the current board, Nick, Becky, Mashariki, and Jamie, and our current committee. Those four, plus Angela, Marie, Eileen, Tom, Kaylee, and Ken. And to everybody who's been a part of the committee in the last 10 years, who I could not do this without. Bill, John, Kelly, Susan, Tom, Rachel, Carly, Ray, Ruth, Deb, Rick, Carolee, and Wendy. <laughs> Wendy, you were Wendy Hofspiegel when this started. We've had our share of recognition in the media, in the press, online. We have an outstanding art entry in Wikipedia, thanks to Susan Gerbic and her crew of guerrilla Wikipedia editors. It's got information about Free Thought Day in general and our event in particular. We had the opportunity to have a really cool article in Secular Nation a couple years ago that celebrated us and the whole point of this. And in fact, just two years ago, some of us made it to Studio 40, that's Fox News, our local Fox affiliate, where we had our, I don't know, two minutes of fame talking about California Free Thought, free thought Day, inviting people to come join us that year. We've also been in the news for other things, like when a school district in Sacramento sent out a flyer to all the parents encouraging their students to bring a Bible to class. That was cool. So we use that as an opportunity to say, well, if you're going to send out a flyer encouraging students to bring a Bible, let's just go ahead and force the school district to send the flyer about California Free Thought Day. And we did, and they did, and it was great. We even had local news show up about it. So yeah, I mean, if you can't beat them, join them. We have a YouTube channel. If you haven't followed us yet, please find us on YouTube and click that subscribe button. And every video that I can find that Paul Story has provided me and all the videos that that um, Roger has, has recorded and with Pam, they're all up there. And thank the three of you so much for giving us that content, archiving it forever. And so you can go right now and watch, I don't know, 12, 13 years of Free Thought Day up there. Somewhere out there, allegedly, is the very first video. I don't know where it is, but if any of you have it, I'd love to see it and add it to our list. Now, I should probably talk about 2020, last year, the year of COVID, where for the first time in 20 years, we did not have an in-person event. In 19 or 2016, we got hit with rain. And thanks to some very quick thinking by our volunteers and some quick adjustments, we were able to bring the entire event indoors. But in 2020, that was a whole new thing. And so we had to take all of that work and effort, all of the speakers, and turn them into videos, which was then switched, uh, sorry, <laughs> uh, brought together, stitched together. And the end result was fantastic. I'm really proud of what we did in such a short time. If you haven't watched last year's video, it's about an hour and 15 minutes. It's fantastic. Really great presentations and speeches, including one from another elected official, Zoe Lundgren from San Jose. Lofgren, sorry, Zoe Lofgren. So follow us on TikTok, follow us on Instagram and on Facebook. Wherever you can, we are at Free Thought Day everywhere. That video, by the way, has been watched 4,000 times. And when we live streamed it on Free Thought Day, it was watched by hundreds of people simultaneously. So it was sort of like we were together. Now, speaking of TikTok, that's the latest thing. So of course we have to jump on it. And I have to say, our committee, <laughs> they are such troopers. Becky and Tom and Mashariki, um, Marie, Kaylee, joining me at the Capitol and others 
to record some really fun videos. And if you don't have TikTok, go download it. Go find us at Free Thought Day and follow us. We also post most of those videos on other social media platforms. But we have a lot of fun doing it. And we also have fun following some of the trends. Now, if you've never seen TikTok before, this probably won't mean anything to you. But we had a blast following this trend. Here's a song to get to know about me. I'll start with my name, my age, my height, my gender identity, and my favorite game. This is where I live now, and this is where I'm from. Here's what I do for work, and what I hope to become. Here's a guilty pleasure and a pet peeve, and something I like, a goal that I hope one day to achieve. And can I ride a bike? My favorite place I've been to, and a place I want to go. My favorite time of year, and my favorite TV show. Here's a random fact you might not guess. Surprise! A thing that brings me joy and brings me stress. I really try to avoid that. I have this many siblings, that's the size of my shoe. And I hope you'll use this song to let everybody get to know So please you. follow us at Prevot Day on all the social medias. Which brings me to this year. Our 20th anniversary, our 20th anniversary, our 20th annual California Free Thought Day. If everything goes as planned, and I think you know what I mean by that, it will happen this Sunday, October 10, 2021, at the California State Capitol. But it is more than just that day. Free Thought Weekend, of course, includes the main event, but on Saturday, we have Leadership Day in the afternoon and the Supporters Reception in the evening. On Monday, we have Advocacy Day. Now, these are separate ticketed events. Leadership Day is great for any of you who want to learn about how to get more involved, how to be a little more political, how to encourage others to volunteer, how to advocate more for people, how to learn what intersectionality is and why it's important. You'll spend the day with other leaders from across the state. The supporters reception happens in the evening and that's basically where we fund this whole thing. We take you and everyone else and all the speakers and authors and podcasters and we bring out really yummy food, hors d'oeuvres, desserts, an open bar with live entertainment, some music, some comedy. It is a lot of fun. Then, of course, the main event happens on Sunday, and on Monday, we're doing an advocacy day where we will connect you with your elected official from your area to talk about secular issues, things that are important to us, like contraception, birth control, abortion rights, health care, things that are beyond atheism, absolutely, but still important, like I said, with our core values. We'll do a little training first, and then we'll show you, we'll connect you to your officials. This year's speakers, I'm really thrilled to announce so many great people, including Cy Babe, that's Yvette de Tremont, Deborah Olson, who is the granddaughter of California's governor, only atheist governor. We have Sarah Levin formerly with the Secular Coalition for America, now doing her own thing, helping people to become more secular involved, secularly involved. We have entertainment, including Leanne Lord, Abraham Mackey, Joey Fabian. We have podcasters and authors, including Ross and Carrie from Oh No, Ross and Carrie, and Alexis Record, who just put out a book about C.S. Lewis, and its religious overtones and how she has come out of faith and, and with a child and how all that comes together. It's incredible. We're giving awards away to people who absolutely deserve them. Of course, Minga is getting an award for it being the 20th year, but we're also recognizing Margaret Downey and Bruce Gleason from Southern California for their leadership in groups down there. 
We're bringing people in to do our leadership and advocacy days. We've got students to award money to for their scholarship entries. And our MC is comedian Ian Harris. Now, you're probably wondering about COVID. So are we. But we've committed to meet or exceed every guideline put forth by the state, by the county, by the city, and of course, by the CDC. If that means that we cannot have Free Thought Day, we won't have it, or we'll postpone it, or again, make it a video. But the health of everybody is our most important priority. We do remain optimistic about having these events in person. But we have, of course, Free Thought Day is already outdoors. And the other events that take place during the weekend, they'll be moved outdoors if we need to. We already have those venues secured. Of course, we'll do social distancing. We'll wipe down every counter. We'll require a mask, vaccination status, all of that stuff when recommended by the CDC. And we've moved Advocacy Day to happen over Zoom. So no matter where you are in California, you can participate on Monday's event so that we can connect you with your elected officials that morning. Now, if you want to be a part of all of this, you can sponsor, you can register, you can donate. I ask you to do so whenever you're ready. You can scan the QR code with your phone or just visit freethoughtday.org. Of course, you can ask questions and I can answer them for you. You can email us, you can find us on social media. One way or the other, I hope you can make it out to the events. And as far as the future of all of this, what's the next 20 years of Free Thought Day going to look like? I don't know, but I want to see more diversity in our committee, in our volunteers, in our marketing, in our speakers, in our authors and podcasters. I want to see more audience interaction. This is something that was inspired by Judy Saint. We're going to try for it this year. Get the audience more involved during the event so you're not just sitting in a chair. I want more political recognition by our elected officials. I want them to ask us to nominate them for an award. I want them to ask us if they can come to our event and talk rather than the reverse. I want more children's activities. It's already family friendly, but I want games for kids to play to keep them occupied while their parents are checking out all the great speakers and community booths. And I want so much more public awareness. I think we've all heard of the Greek festival in Sacramento. We've all heard of Aftershock. Why can't Free Thought Day be just as big? And so we're growing. We're gonna take a group photo every year and every year that photo gets a little bit bigger. But I hope you can join us for this year's, our 20th and maybe even for the next 20 years. So again, I wanna thank Minga and Jerry the entire committee. Pamela, thank you so much. And AOF for giving us the opportunity to talk today. And uh, there we go. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have about Free Thought Day. Thank you so much. All right, so I see a thumbs up. <laughs> thank you, Minga. Um, you're all muted, but you are welcome to either chat your question or you can unmute and ask your question. And I'll do my best to try and keep that going in some way. Um, hopefully we don't all talk over each other, but that doesn't seem to be a problem right now. But I do see Minga with her hand up. That is perfect for you to ask the first question. You are loud and clear. You look great, Minga. Actually, I just want to add on uh, thank yous. Um, I want to reemphasize the thank you to Jerry Sloan for the whole idea of a proclamation, because I don't think we would have had it without him. Somebody who kind of is no longer with us, uh, that really there would not be a third Free Thought Day without her is Beverly Church. And there wouldn't be anything past 2010 if it weren't for David Diskin. So thank you, David, for, for just expanding this uh, beyond what any of us had ever envisioned and incorporating more and more. Sticking with it this long is amazing. So I just want to thank you for all you've done and what you are doing and apparently what you will be doing. So anyway, thanks a bunch. Absolutely. 
All right. Does anyone have any other comments, any questions, anything that they'd like to add before we wrap up? Hey, David, this is Kaylee. Thank you so much for the presentation. You know, having been on the committee for, I think, five years now, I didn't even know the uh, beginnings of Free Thought Day. So it's great to learn about, you know, everyone that was involved in, in making it happen. And, you know, the time I've had with it, it's been great so far. And I love seeing the event grow every year. Um, one in the beginning of your presentation, you're talking about the Salem witchcraft trials. I was thinking, I wonder if some of these women convince themselves that they were witches because of everything going on and being said and just the atmosphere I could imagine that <clears throat> it'd be easy to do that <laughs> yeah it, it absolutely did happen um it's it's so sad it, it, you know I think we've all seen or experienced situations where some kind of religious brainwashing has taken effect on us or other people people that we love around us ourselves Guilt, especially religious guilt, is heavy on people. And in my research for this presentation, there were definitely a few of those women that, uh, that truly believed. They didn't just confess to get out of the punishment or to reduce their sentence. They confessed because they truly felt or thought that they were inhabited by the devil, that they had somehow caused harm to someone else through magical thinking. I'm sure there's probably people that feel that way today. That's a really good point. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Roger has one. Hey, Roger. Hey. See, I recently learned that uh, this phenomenon of... Uh, executing witches was really big in England as well. It wasn't just restricted to Massachusetts. Um, what do you think about that? Do you know anything about that? I don't know much about it. You know, um, I do know that it happened. I, I, I believe that while it did happen, if you were to compare like a per capita, for example, or just the frequency at which it happened, hmm. um, it was run amok in Salem, which is why it's, it's known for that. Um, and at the time that it happened in Salem, the idea of, of witches even, let alone accusing someone of witchcraft and sentencing them to death, that was very much on the decline by the late uh, 1600s. Mm. I'm sure it still happened here and there. But England had a pretty good control on it by that point, yet not in Puritan Salem. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Arlene. Hi. Hey. <laughs> um, uh, I, <laughs> I just have a comment really. Um, uh, California Free Thought Day was my first ever event that I attended, um, uh, as far as like me being an atheist, I realized, or I became an atheist in 20, um, 2012. And I kind of kept it a secret for a couple of years because I was living in Virginia and I was afraid of my friends kind of like pressuring me and just harassing me about being a non-believer and stuff. But when I moved to uh, California in 2014, uh, I visited California Free Thought Day. I attended the event and uh, I loved it. And if I do have the opportunity, I always attend. So it's like one of my favorite events that I attend. And, and to me, it just has a lot of uh, like uh, uh, significant value. <laughs> and uh, I just wanted to say thank you so much for putting this together and everybody behind the scenes. Like I know a couple of people. Um, I'm just very grateful, very grateful for this event. Absolutely, Arlene. And for those who don't know or maybe have forgotten, Arlene is one of the recipients of last year's uh, volunteer awards for um, starting the uh, Secular Latino Group down near Southern California. So awesome. Yes, thank you. I also started the Fresno Latino Atheist um, Group through CVAS, and that one actually, uh, I celebrated an anniversary. It's been five years already. 
way cool. <laughs> and uh, speaking of new traditions that we're starting, um, Arlene, I noticed your hat. Um, I don't know if anyone else happened to catch it. You're on native land. Uh, this year, uh, we will be reading a statement about that very thing and how Free Thought Day coincidentally uh, takes place right around the same day as what was formerly called Christopher Columbus Day, which of course we are not celebrating, but we are celebrating Indigenous Peoples Day and paying respect that this is their land that we happen to be on. And so we are thrilled to have statements along those lines uh, that we'll be reading on all three days of California Free Thought Day. Thanks, Arlene. Great to see you, by the way. Mario, I see your hand up. Uh, thank you. I, uh, I would uh, just uh, confess that this is the first time I have uh, joined you guys here. I've heard about you guys for quite a while. Um, and I just wanted to comment that uh, however important our uh, free thinking is in uh, freeing us from uh, uh, religious dogmas of various types, uh, some of which are, we are suffering here with uh, what I call the American Taliban uh, fundamentalist, uh, uh, you know, people who are waiting for the end of the world and thinking they don't need to do anything more about this one. Uh, but I really wanted to uh, just mention the fact that uh, in addition to re religious free thought, uh, you know, America suffers from uh, political dogmas and uh, uh, I don't know, cultural traditions, you know, uh, that, uh, I don't know, I just finished reading uh, Eric Fromm's Escape from Freedom, and, uh, you know, how people are just some, like, afraid of freedom, you know, they, uh, so many people need someone to tell them, or they adopt other people's ideas, and uh, really are not thinking for themselves, which is one of the great things wrong with this nation. So uh, I just say that in uh, in honoring uh, what you guys have been doing here for many years and uh, just to encourage you to uh, just keep spreading. I was really appreciative of the uh, opening up of social justice and uh, civic engagement as a part of the principles you're working with. So um, Anyway, I just want to give my thanks and uh, share my uh, appreciation for the work you guys have done. Thank you. Thanks, Mario. And I hope you can make it out this year and join us. I'll give it a shot. Oh, <laughs> Thank you. Nancy, hey there. Hi. Hi, all. But it's great to see everyone. I just want to make a quick comment. Uh, this was a really nice program. I enjoyed it very much. Learned a lot. And... Uh, just want to let you know, for the past few years, we have had a tour of the Capitol building prior to the start uh, of the speeches at Free Thought Day. Um, however, the last time I've called a couple of times at the Capitol building and they might be closed, we may not be able to have the tour, but I hope, I'm hoping we will. I'm keeping my fingers crossed and checking up with them. Uh, it's been a popular thing because all of our um, visitors are authors and speakers, many of them who come from other states, they like to see the Capitol. They've been very good in attendance at those things, at those tours, so. Absolutely, Nancy, and, uh, and thank you for oh, and thank the last you. few years. Thank you, oh, I, thank you, you're welcome. Thank you to all of the committee, the board members, because you do such a fabulous job every year. And I'm so glad Thanks. to see it going on. Thank you, Nancy. Yeah, it is a, it's, it's a really cool tour. If you're not sure what Nancy's talking about, it is professionally done by the docents within the state. It's not done by us. And uh, we just gather people and they take it from there. It's about an hour long, hour and a half, something like that. It ends just before Free Thought Day begins. So if you want to show up to the Capitol a little early, as Nancy said, if it happens this year, so you can register right now. And we're going to keep a close tab on that and let people know if it's going to happen. Thank you, Nancy. All right. Any other comments or questions? Hey, what, this is Kaylee again. I just wanted to say, you know, uh, 
I, I really hope everyone can make it out this year. I know it's going to be great. And, uh, you know, the future is unknown, but just thinking about next year's event when we can actually do the capital tour and have everything in full swing, I just know it's going to be a great year. So really hoping to see everyone this year, next year, and in all the years to come. Thank you so much, David, for your presentation. Oh, thanks, Kaylee. Kaylee is my right-hand person on Free Thought Day. Uh, she's our stage manager. She makes sure that the schedule goes perfectly. And she has done that with absolute perfection the last couple of years. Thank you so much, Kaylee. Love to do it. All right. Well, and I think that was our last comment. So I'm going to go ahead and give this meeting back to Pam. I don't know if there's anything else on the agenda for today, but I'll let Pam announce that. And I just want to say again, thank you to all of you who've watched this. Um, I will try and find some kind of way to get the recording up on our YouTube channel and Facebook page. So if you follow us at Facebook, then uh, I don't know, as soon as I can, we'll get it up there. Oh, Galen asks, does social justice include animal justice as well? And I can say absolutely yes, it absolutely does. In fact, quite a few people on our committee are very much dedicated to animal justice just as well. So, so thanks for that question. Are there. people vegan as well? <clears throat> Uh, I know that our entire reception is vegetarian and vegan. I know that a lot of our committee is vegetarian or vegan. Um, and we definitely do everything that we can to make sure that the food that we provide, uh, that there is always, we, we consider vegetarian to be the default at all our events. And, uh, but we do offer other options too. Yeah. Um, we have not yet had any opportunity to sponsor or suggest for any bills that I can recall that were specifically about animal justice, but that has always been on our radar. So I appreciate that question. Thanks, Gail. Or Galen, sorry, Galen. Can Thank I you. add for just a second also, um, not just with Free Thought Day, but in, in a lot of the other sec secular groups, I know that has been um, a topic that has come up. And at Sunday Assembly, we have had a phenomenal speaker from Vegan Outreach um, speak to the group. And, and that was a wonderful presentation. So I know I've seen that discussion uh, in the secular community uh, here in Sacramento, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was Jackie Va, who was that speaker. Yeah, she's great. All right. Yeah. Well, thank you again. I'm going to shut up now and give everything back to Pamela. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you so much, David. I. I'm assuming then that you have, have the recording yourself since you were mentioning where it will show up on YouTube. Well, I pushed the record button and it says that it's recording. I think okay. it's gonna end up in my cloud or yours. So it's in someone's cloud and we'll just have to figure out where it went and then share it with each other. Okay, well, we'll keep in touch if that goes awry somehow. For sure. <laughs> so we are AOF, Atheists and Other Free Thinkers, sponsoring this event today. And you will find our uh, dot, dot org, aofonline.org, <laughs> is typed in at the first item on chat today. I'd like to mention David brought up Judy Saint. She is going to be uh, with the AOF presentation October 31st in a Zoom meeting. And you'll find out more about that from uh, the Reason Center and SAC fan emails that they send out about events. Next month, AOF is sponsoring a potluck picnic in the park on September 28th. And so we are going to have some in-person time there in the park and of course, everyone is invited. I have nothing else to add. Does anyone have anything to add at the end of today's Zoom? No, then, then I will say goodbye to everyone until we see each other again.